Long time ago, I have two nephews. When my nephews were young and little, um, I did not know one time, one time I did not know what to get for their birthdays. I mean, they have their birthdays a week apart from each other, so we used to celebrate their birthdays together. And running out of the gift idea, birthday gift ideas, I asked their father, my brother-in-law, and I asked, um, what about I just give them money, cash, so they can go to a store like Target and buy, get whatever they need or want. And his response was like, no, 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 I will never do that again. I was like, what do you mean? Well, recently, the grandmother gave them money so they can go to a store and buy, get something, whatever they want or need. But we were there forever. Because huh? they did not know what they need or what they want. And they were picking all this weird stuff, and which I knew for sure that they would not play with it. If we buy them, it's going to be a waste of money. And they're just speaking all this. And I had to say, no, no, not that, not that. And they were getting upset. Why not this? Why you don't let me have it? Why you don't let me have it? I said, we were there forever. I don't want to do that again. Do you know, do we know, not only the little kids, do we know what we really need in our lives? Do you know what you really want? I mean, in a light way. Um, when I ask people, hey, what do you want to eat for dinner? Where do you want to go? And do you know what number one answer that I hear? I don't know, anything, anywhere. I mean, sometimes when it's asked me, I also say that a lot. Mm, sometimes I'm not even sure what I want. Um, you probably have something in your closet or storage that you bought it because once you thought you needed it, or you wanted it, so you bought it and you never used it, or you probably use it like a couple times only, and just stuck there. Um, you don't wear that anymore. But it's like, but these people they cannot throw them away. You know why? Because they say it's pretty much brand new. It's pretty much brand new. But you thought that you needed it. Eh? You thought you wanted it. That. Eh? I mean, that happens. But not just in a light way in our lives, but and. In more depth, do you know, do we know what we really need in our lives? What are you missing? Well, let me put it this way. Why did you come here? What are you looking for? What are you searching for? It seems like, sadly, some people come to church for far less than what Christianity is truly offering. Far less. In this story, in our text, we see people left Jesus. Large group of people, number of people walked away from Jesus. And yes, actually it says disciples left Jesus. Now, we are not talking about these disciples. Does not mean those 12 disciples of Jesus? I mean, there were a lot of greater number of the followers who actually followed Jesus besides those 12 for a quite amount of time. A large follower there, there. And large number of them left on this day from Jesus, walked away. Why? Well, in this text, Jesus said, do you take offense at this? In other words, some people were, for, were offended by Jesus. I mean, what can be offensive about Jesus? I mean, you and I, you Christians, we know that Jesus is loving. He's the most gentle, humble, patient, and kind than anybody you will ever meet in your life. He's there. I mean, he's the top of his character. Oh, what can be there to be offended by this person, Jesus? But clearly, these people were offended by Jesus and they left him. They walked away. You see, and we see that in our days too. For a while, a person being a part of the church, come to church, following, committed, but they feel offended somehow, in some way, 
by something, and they leave. I see three ways how these people were offended in this story. One, they were offended because Jesus did not give them what they wanted. Offended because Jesus did not give them what they wanted. Now, on that morning, remember last time, last Sunday I mentioned this, that Jesus fed the 5,000 people and plus more, right? After they experienced that with the small food, the miracle. Uh, that night, the Jesus and his disciples went across the sea to the other town. And the following morning, that morning, this morning, the people were searching for Jesus, and they realized that Jesus and his disciples were gone. So they searched, and they realized Jesus is across the sea at the other town. So they got themselves in a boat. All this large number of people, the crowd, all found a boat, and they went across the sea following Jesus. Did you hear me? Following Jesus all the way, willingly, voluntarily, fervently. Where's Jesus? We got to go to Jesus. We need to follow Jesus. Why? Why did they do that? Verse 26, Jesus, when they came to them, Jesus, this is what Jesus says. Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me. Not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Not because you saw signs, but you got your bread, free bread, full. Wait, 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 what do you mean, Jesus? What do you mean by not because you saw signs? They clearly saw the signs. They were the one who experienced this sign, defeating these 5,000 people and more with a small amount of food, five loaves of bread and two small fish. Miraculously, Jesus fed them. They saw the sign. They were the one who received that food. And look previously what it was said in verse 14 in this text. Verse 14, after that event, feeding 5,000, when the people saw the sign... That he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. You see? They saw the sign. So they even tried to make Jesus to be their king by force. We got to make him as our king. So Jesus, what do you mean? They, not because you saw sign. Sign has a meaning behind it. He points to indicating to a certain reality or meaning behind the sign. That's what sign does. In other words, feeding 5,000 people with five bread and two fish was to serve as a sign indicating who Jesus really is. Think about it. Are you with me? Now, the bread that he gave out to the people never been never grew up, never been harvested from the ground. The grain in there, never. The fish that he passed to the people, never been in the water. Now think what that means. Can you imagine holding a fish in your hand that never been in the water? Never born, swam, grew up in the water. Can there be a fish? But there was. You know what this means? These fish and bread were created, created in the hands of Jesus Christ. Just like the Father fed these Israel people in the wilderness supernaturally by the bread called manna from above, from heaven. They never grew up from the ground, from above. So this Jesus in the wilderness feeding these Israel people by the work of creation. Now what does that tell you about this Jesus? The author John wanted to make this more clear for us in the following story. After that event, Jesus told his disciples, let's go across the sea of the Tiberias, the Galilee, and to the other side. And I'll meet you there, guys. You guys go first. And the disciples went across the sea to the boat, and they faced a severe storm. I mean, originally, it wouldn't take that long to go across the sea to the other town, but because of the winds and the waves, they were not making any progress. They were struggling, having a hard time. They were facing fearful moment, threatening, life-threatening moment. And at that moment, Jesus, in the darkness, walked above the winds and the waves and came to them. 
That's the story. The famous story we know. She's walking on the water. Jesus, I mean, John does not tell us the detail of this event like other gospel narrative. No Peter's event, nothing. Because his focus is only on this, revealing to us who Jesus really is. See? You see? These people were struggling because of the wind and the wave, but Jesus is above it. If they are under his feet, he is walking. What is torturing you? What is too much for you? Oh, this is too much for me. They are under the feet of Jesus Christ. He is the sovereign Lord. You finite. You are suffering under those, but not him. He's above it. He rules over it. This was what some in the Old Testament was praising about God, Yahweh. Psalm, it says, Yahweh, you ride the wind and you walk on the waves. Exactly this was what Jesus was doing. Now, what does that tell you about this Jesus? This is what Yahweh, God, does. Now, John wanted to make it more clear. And this event tells you that. When, when Jesus was approaching to the disciples, now, our John text does not say it, but you can find this other narrative gospel, gospel narrative. The disciples asked, Who are you? Who is it? Who are you? And our John text tells the answer of Jesus. What does Jesus say to them? Jesus says, It is, I am. Do not be afraid. I am. That's the name of God. I am. When Moses, in the Old Testament, met God at the burning bush, Moses asked God, who are you? And God says, I am, I am. The name of God, Yahweh, I am. When these disciples in the storm ask, who are you? Jesus says, ego, me" in Greek, original text. I am. He rebuilt himself with the name of God. I am Yahweh. So do not be afraid. He is Yahweh in flesh. He is the one who is from God and who is God. But these people, the crowd, did not understand who Jesus really is. They saw the sign, but they did not get the sign. They did not understand the sign. They see, but they don't see. They did not understand at whose presence they were standing before, his majesty and his worth. Do you understand at whose presence that you are in this morning? There was not the reason, this was not the reason why these people willingly, voluntarily, and fervently followed Jesus. To them, Jesus was just a wonder-working boy who has some special talent and power who can give them what they want. And Jesus, I see, I see that you have a special power. Oh, you can do this. Also, you can give us free bread. You can give us free fish. Maybe something else too. We will make you as our king. Then you will give us all these things. You have a power. Then we'll be rich. And through you, I can have life of abundance. Be our king. That's what they wanted. The motivation why they followed Jesus was hoping that, that Jesus can give them what they desire. Did they believe in Jesus? Yes. They believed that Jesus has power. That's why they were there, don't you see? They believed in Jesus. People can believe and follow Jesus for various reasons. Some come, I believe Jesus, hoping that they can be reached through Jesus, hoping that the God may probably, I'll, I'll believe Jesus, can God bless my business, health, or well-being of my children and my family, can it be secured by this Jesus? Or having a good marriage, can I have a good marriage? Can I have a good children who obey me? Good children? God somehow will bless my children. So my children turn out to be great guys. Go to good school. Prosper life. Can I find someone special through Jesus? Can this Jesus make sure 
that I don't have any cancer in my life? Can this Jesus make sure that I have a financial stability all the time? Can he? Things that I don't want to have, can he remove it? Can he guarantee it? But when Jesus says no, do not live for the bread that perishes. In other words, not for the temporal things that perishes. Do not let your life be about those things, temporal things. Do not make your life about them. Not those, but let me give you something that is better, something that is eternal. Have me. Have me. Then I'll give you the satisfaction to your inner being. Then I'll give you the meaning to your life. Have me. Then I'll give you forgiveness from your sin and guilt. Freedom from the shame. Help me that I can give you the salvation from death. Help me. I can give you something that is eternal, far better. Help me as your Lord. And people do not like that. When they heard it, verse 41, the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Get me. Church, are you with me? Everybody here? And all who are joining us on live streaming? Jesus does not guarantee you a life free from problem, free from struggles, free from hardship. He does not guarantee you a life free from sorrow, life free from tears. But you can be sure of this. You can be sure of his goodness and love. That through all, if you come and trust him and follow him, even if you go through the struggles in life and pain and sorrows and tearful moments in life, he will give you something good through those moments that will last forever. That your faith may be stronger, your maturity, your growth, your change, your transformation, you be more like Jesus, that you may have joy and glory with the life of Jesus in the coming kingdom, and that will last forever. That's what I give you. Through all that, something that is eternal, that's what he guarantees. Not everything right now, right now, in that. Wait, wait, then does that mean Jesus does not care about what we go through in this life? To Jesus, everything is about in that kingdom of God in heaven and not much about what we go through in this life, what we face, what we struggle, what we need. He does not really care about them. No. Brothers, sisters, do you remember? Jesus was the one who fed this crowd even though they did not ask for the food. Jesus was the one who says, you know what? They need food. They need food. They must be hungry and starving. And some of them, as they go long distance walking back, I don't want them to be fainted. So, disciple, give them food. He was the one. He knows that our physical needs matter to us. He knows that your children matter to us. He knows that we need bread. There are things that matter to us in this life. He was the one who said through the Lord's prayer, pray, ask for this, give us this day our daily bread. Doesn't that scripture teach you? If anyone is sick, call elders and pray that you may be healed. Does he care about what we go through in this life? Yeah, absolutely. But do not make your life about all about temporal things now, now, now. Do not treat Jesus like a genie of a magic lamp who can do your agenda. Then you wanted the temporal things right now. And when Jesus says, no, not that, but I'll give you something more and better. They did not like it. They were upset, so they walked away. Secondly, 
offended because of what Jesus claims to be. Offended. They were offended because of what Jesus claims to be. He said, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. This means Jesus existed before his physical birth. That he came down. He came from above. There's his origin, where he's from, is above. None of us are like that. Our existence, our beginning began from our birth. But he said, I was there and I came down. And he plainly said in verse 62, if you look into that, he says, I will ascend to where I was before. He plainly said that. I'll go, and that's where I was before. I came down from there. And in this story, Jesus plainly said, anyone who believes in him, he will raise him up on the last day. This is God talk. He's talking about resurrection. Only God can say, I can give resurrection. He claims to be the Son of God, the one who is from above, and people took offense at it. At first, verse 30, so they said to him, What sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Isn't it funny? Based on this chapter, they're asking for a sign. I mean, it clearly said after the feeding 5,000 people, verse 14, they saw the sign. And verse 26, Jesus says, Not because you saw the sign. You didn't get the sign. You didn't see the sign. And here again, Oh, then show us a sign that we may see and believe. And this is the endless cycle. Sign, they don't get it. Ask you for a sign. They don't get it. Ask you for a sign. Oh, God, if you're true and real, if you care, do this for me. Then I'll believe you. A lot of people. If God is real, let me, let me see. Let me see something, then I'll believe God. Well, the plenty God already showed to them, which they did not perceive. They did not get it. Blinded. And when this Jesus refused to play their game, watch their reaction. This is how their attitude dramatically changed. Verse 42. They said, Is not this Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he say, now say, I have come down from heaven. A lot of people are okay with saying that Jesus was a nice person. He was gentle. He was loving. He is kind. He was wise. He's a great teacher. And most of the people are fine with that. But as soon as they hear that Jesus is the Son of God, He is the only Savior from above, whom you need to believe and obey. He's God in flesh. As soon as they hear that, they have a problem. I mean, you can even get persecuted and even get killed in some part of the world. You know that. They don't like it. They feel offended by this claim who Jesus is to be. And these people's attitude dramatically changed. And Jesus is not giving what they want. And he claims to be this. And it's like, from rabbi, this is, who do you think you are? I know who you are exactly. You are just nothing but a son of Joseph. How dare you claim to be that? And a lot of people claim to know Jesus. I know who Jesus is. He was nothing but a Jew who got crucified and killed. Period. I know who he is. They feel offended by this claim that he is the sovereign Lord over all. Thirdly, they were offended because the teaching was too hard. Teaching is too hard. As we, I shared with you last Sunday, right, about Jesus being the bread of life, remember? And then Jesus, how do you offer you, you yourself to us as a bread of life? And he explained, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. What do you mean? And through that, Jesus was explaining his sacrificial death on the cross, that he died on the cross, his body torn and blood shed so that we can be forgiven. He died on behalf of us instead of us for the forgiveness of our sin. And that is how we get life through Jesus. He explained that. But when they heard this, 
Watch this, first look at 60. When many of the disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? And right before this verse, verse 59, you will see that Jesus was teaching this in synagogue. Now, the Jewish worship place at the time. So let me put it in a modern day context. Good? A pastor is preaching in a church. And the congregation, some of the congregations are saying, Pastor, your teachings are too hard for the ordinary people to understand. Can you just water it down a little bit and make it more entertaining? I mean, no deep stuff. No serious, too serious. No deep truth. No, 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 no. I mean, and not, not some, don't say things that they can offend people. All right, make it more funny, make it more interesting. If not, who's going to listen to you? Who's going to come? You don't want to lose people. Don't you want people to come to your church? So come on, just, just do it. Verse 16, but Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. If my teaching about my humiliation, my teaching about my death, my teaching about my earthly work, my earthly ministry is too much for you to burden, oh, this is too hard, too much. Then what if I teach you about my work where I was there before, my ascent, my glory, the who really I am eternally, my infinite wisdom and power and majesty and both eternal work that I do. If I tell you that, how can you bear them then? I tell you the real issue here. This is not the complication of the teaching is what matters here. The smartiness of this body, no matter how smart you are, what kind of things you study outside, this smartiness has no help at all here. Because the spiritual things can be only understood by the Spirit of God. In other words, unless God draws that person to Jesus, unless the Holy Spirit opens the person's eyes so that the person understands and believes and follows, the one will not come to Jesus. That's what verse 65 Jesus said. They won't get it. Unless that happens, they won't get it. They will not believe. They will not be even be interested in this. But if Father calls them to me, they will come to me, hear my voice, and believe and follow. I will not water it down in order to please the crowd. Verse 66. After that, Many of the disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Many of the disciples, you see? Disciple here means, in our context, not one-time visitor, not, not some visitor. Disciple who have been, for the quiet amount of time, followed, joined, and committed, and they are leaving. They are leaving. And frankly, it seems like, you can see here, that Jesus does not even beg them to stay or hold their hands. Come on, don't leave. I have a life. I have a word of eternal life. Come, 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 don't leave. We are doing something important. Come, join us. He doesn't do that. I mean, if he was your pastor, then some of you may think he's a worse minister. Because it seems like he does not care whether people come or leave. He does not send a text message, oh, we missed you. He does not give even a call, even if they don't come to church. He does not per- try to persuade them to stay. He does not hold anybody's hand to come. Sometimes he gives hard sermons for you to, it's hard to understand. And he's not willing to worry it down. Sometimes he gives offensive words 
that uh, they can be offensive. Some people may not like it. He frankly does not care. He just keeps teaching. I'm reading the Bible, and I cannot get away that kind of picture of Jesus. Do you see what I see? Clearly, Jesus is not interested in having large crowd around him. How many people can gather before him? Because the kingdom of God is not hanging on the number of the people, but he himself. And we know that the message of the gospel is offensive to all people at first. And that's what I do every Sunday. I offend people, and I try to be good at it. Faithfully, I try to offend people. I'm going to do that. I hope I am good at it each time. Because the gospel is all the time at the beginning. Is you are a sinner. You have a problem. You need to repent. You need to turn back. You are nothing apart from God. You got to bend and worship him. You and God is holy and righteous. If you don't repent, if you don't come to him, there is an eternal punishment and judgment. And that sounds very offensive. And the good news, who Jesus is, what he will do for us, all the blessing comes after Apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, they would not understand the deity of Jesus nor see the true value worth of Jesus. That he is what you really need and what you really want. The ultimate treasure. I'm almost done. As I go back to the beginning of this message, do you know what you really need in your life? Why did you come? What are you looking for? Why do you follow Jesus? For the sense of security? For a sense of relief from your guilty feeling or shame by somehow doing the religious activities? Or applause of the people? Or finding a new community through the church? or recognition of people, or some place of leadership, or a successful career, or you want to find new friends, having friends for church, is that why you came? Or somehow guaranteed a good school for our students, oh God, somehow make me, help me to get into good school, or hoping to meet a potential spouse, oh let me go to church, maybe I can meet someone good, some good guy or girl there, or a successful career, or what? Or oh, making a building a network for you over your children? Or oh, we, we can be connected with a lot of people? Or somehow you want to make your children good behaving children somehow by the church system? Or maybe God will bless me financial stability. What kind of bread do you want to be guaranteed by this Jesus? What kind of bread are you looking for. What do you pray about? What do you ask to Jesus? And if you cannot get it, if the Lord says to you, my grace for you is sufficient, that's it. Then will you walk away? Verse 67, so Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the word of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are, that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the twelve? Not for something, not for someone. 
the object of my faith, why I come, why I believe, and what I follow you, it's not my parents, it's not my spouse, it's not something, it's not pastor. Pastor is not what I believe. He's not what I'm following. The object of my faith is no more than by you, Jesus. It is to have you. It is to know you. You have the words of eternal life, and you are the one I am after. Nothing else. No one else. You, my faith is about you and you alone. And how sweet is the words of Jesus. I think he will say the same thing to us. The word he said to the 12, did I not choose you? I would love to hear that. That he looking in my eyes and say, did I not choose you, Billy? He look at you and say, did I not choose you? The reason why you are here, my brothers, sisters, all who trust in him, It's not because you chose to follow him, but because he chose you first. Because the Father draws you to Jesus Christ. And that's why you came to know and believe. Did I not choose you first? Let's pray.